Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's weekly, bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy for the COVID-19 economy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. Our guest today is Jed Coco, chief economist at the job site Indeed.com. Jed also is a senior fellow at the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at UC Berkeley. Prior to joining Indeed, he was chief economist at the real estate website Trulia. Before that, Jed was research director at the Public Policy Institute of California. Jed is a PhD in economics from Harvard. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please identify yourself and your organization just as if you were asking your question in person. The event's being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Jed Coco, welcome to the prescription. It's great to have you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Howard. Thanks for having me here. Back in April, you wrote an article called Making Sense of the Labor Market During COVID-19. I hope we can spend some time today talking about your current views on the labor market and the real estate market during and after the pandemic. In that article, you made a prescient prediction. You said both the acute and chronic phases of this crisis are likely to hurt most those with less education, lower wages, and other labor market disadvantages, therefore widening inequality. And households and businesses that were struggling to begin with have the thinnest cushions for surviving the acute phase of this crisis. So that's what you saw in April. We're now uh, in 2021. Uh, what's the labor market look like to you today? How, how, how have things changed and, and how are things going to be going forward? Well, I think the inequities um, that many of us um, were, uh, came out pretty clearly. Um, and it's uh, whether it's the health disparities um, and the inequities in terms of who has uh, gotten the virus, who has been hospitalized, who has died, um, or um, who's been able to work from home um, and who's been having to go in uh, to their jobs in order to hang on to them. Um, huge inequities uh, where more than half of people with a college degree have been able to work from home, 10% uh, or less of people with a high school degree or less uh, have been able to work from home. So I think you know, the inequalities um, are uh, clear, they're pervasive um, and uh, are likely to be aggregate, aggravated by the pandemic. Um, I think the, the good news is that um, the macroeconomic effects of the pandemic um, are um, better than most people expected um, many months ago. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, monthly uh, Wall Street Journal uh, survey of forecasters um, uh, in May called expected uh, an unemployment rate uh, of 11% uh, in December. Uh, in other words, the number uh, that's gonna come up tomorrow um, which is likely to be uh, in the high sixes. Um, and so, you know, by the measure of unemployment, uh, things look much better uh, in aggregate uh, than lots of people expected. Um, the stimulus um, also meant uh, that incomes uh, rose uh, and many households uh, were actually better off uh, thanks to that, and of course, rising asset values. Um, so uh, the sort of overall aggregate picture um, uh, if anything, it's probably a relief, um, even though the inequalities and disparities uh, are probably as bad uh, or worse um, as people expected. So I'd like to pick this apart a little bit more. As, as you said, if you work from home, if you invest in the stock market, the last 10 months were pretty good, at least economically. Uh, but if you're a restaurant server or a hotel worker, not so much. So how do you see this bifurcated economy going forward? Have a good, good description of where it is, but where is it going? So I think uh, we can look at this in a couple of ways. Um, one is uh, what's happening at different sectors of the economy. So much of the inequality uh, and disparity uh, comes out of the fact that uh, the hardest hit sectors uh, were lower wage ones, um, sectors that tend to hire a disproportionate share uh, of African Americans and Hispanics, um, and uh, are going to be some of the slowest sectors to recover. Um, it's still the case uh, that employment in accommodation, uh, particularly the hotel and travel side, um, is significantly below where it was before the pandemic. Um, and uh, that's actually not 
uh, been helped so much um, as uh, lockdowns, lockdowns have been lifted. Um, you know, it's the, the types of sectors that have rebounded better um, have been uh, services um, and retail uh, that really serve a local audience. Uh, so retailer, uh, um, uh, local retailers, uh, restaurants, uh, local services like dental uh, and hair salons, um, they've rebounded much more, um, but services that tend to uh, have a more national or global uh, audience, so arts and entertainment, uh, air travel, uh, sports, uh, have rebounded much less. Uh, and I think that's where we'll continue to see a lot of the disparities coming from. Um, there's been a, a, a few sectors uh, that have actually done very well during the pandemic. Uh, and these are basically sectors that support the stay-at-home economy in different ways, uh, driving, warehouse, uh, and everything having to do with our homes, uh, construction, uh, building supply and improvement stores. Um, all these sectors uh, actually have seen uh, employment gains uh, relative to February just before the pandemic. Um, I think a big question is how much uh, of those shifts in spending that accompanied the pandemic uh, will continue. Uh, I think one of the sort of big open questions for next year um, is um, whether uh, the shift from services to goods uh, in some ways continues. Like, do we continue cooking and exercising at home, uh, in sourcing our entertainment, um, or um, is there this huge pent up demand uh, for services spending um, uh, that will be unleashed once it's possible? Um, for some types of spending, uh, like travel, probably yes. Um, for others, like going to the movies, perhaps not. We might um, be in the midst of uh, some longer term changes in consumption patterns um, that uh, affect uh, the kinds of services, particularly those that are consumed locally. So it's, it's an interesting issue. I think one of the, one of the uh, questions that people have been raising is, has in some way uh, the pandemic accelerated trends that were, that were occurring even before? So for example, shopping malls were in real trouble even before the pandemic. Pandemic happened, things got worse. How does, how does something like that look going forward? Does, does, is this kind of the end of shopping malls as we know them or will they, will they rebound? I think two of the trends that clearly accelerated because of the pandemic are uh, delivery uh, of physical goods um, and uh, working from home uh, or working remotely. Um, I think the, the third thing that we've seen during this pandemic, um, this shift in consumption from services to goods um, has not been an acceleration uh, of pre-existing trends. Um, that's actually been a reversal um, you know, for, for uh, decades. You know, the economy has been you know, shifting from a goods-based economy to a services-based economy. Um, and uh, that uh, reversed slightly this year. Um, so I think you know, this, this question of whether that reversal, um, some parts of that continue, um, or um, whether we uh, get back on the path uh, of a continued shift from goods to services um, is one of the key things to watch next year. So let's talk about, about labor markets, about workers. Um, and, and again, we could sort of bifurcate this, talk about it in a couple of different parts, but let's start with face-to-face -face workers, or grocery clerks, home health aides, teachers. Uh, will, will life return to pre-pandemic normal for them? And, and I think one of the interesting questions is, will employers have to raise their wages to get them to actually come to do those jobs? So I think this question of wages is incredibly important. Um, on one hand, uh, I think there's been a renewed appreciation of a lot of the essential work that happens in person. Um, at the same time, um, unemployment um, is still in the high sixes. Um, it has not returned uh, to where we were before the pandemic. Uh, it's still more than three points higher uh, than its uh, near 50 year low uh, that we saw at the start of this year. Um, and so even if there are uh, some uh, shifts in terms of uh, the labor demand and labor supply across sectors, um, we are still getting back to a world um, that's no longer the tight labor market we were in. Um, and you know, when thinking about um, wages and labor market dynamics, um, we have to keep in mind both um, the uh, compositional shifts, you know, these shifts you know, between goods and services, um, uh, possibly a slowdown uh, in some of the sectors that boomed during the pandemic while 
uh, a continued rebound in some of the services sectors that had shut down earlier. Um, but overlaying on top of that, um, a broader slowdown with higher unemployment, um, that means less upward pressure on wages. Um, and all the things that come with that, aside from all the pandemic specific effects, um, were, uh, are still going to be you know, part of this more chronic phase uh, of recovery. Um, uh, higher unemployment uh, tends to widen inequalities. It tends to mean slower wage increases, less bargaining power for workers, um, less uh, incentive for employers to search more broadly uh, for non-traditional uh, types of applicants, uh, and perhaps less incentive for employers to invest in worker training. Um, and so, you know, all of those sort of more um, run-of-the-mill or expected effects uh, of higher unemployment um, will be with us uh, this year, uh, even as we unwind from some of these big sectoral shifts of the pandemic. So it's kind of an interesting balance, right? On, on one hand, you, as you say, we still have relatively high unemployment. Um, on, on the other hand, there are jobs that people are afraid to do, literally afraid to do. And, and it's gonna be interesting, I guess, to see how, how we find some equilibrium, equilibrium there. Will employers, notwithstanding kind of an overall high unemployment rate, have to pay people more to do jobs that are scary, frankly? That's right. And one of the um, unusual features of this pandemic is how much of an effect there's been on the labor supply side. Um, one piece of that, as you mentioned, um, is people, particularly uh, in in-person or face-to-face -face jobs, um, who maybe has to work or unable to work for health concerns. Um, but equally or more important um, has been the burden of uh, at-home childcare um, and distance learning. Um, and the burden of course has fallen disproportionately on mothers. Um, and when you look at what's happened to employment rates um, by uh, gender and by presence of kids in the household, um, the decline in employment for mothers um, is significantly bigger than that um, either for fathers or for women without kids under 18. Um, and so that's you know, a huge labor supply question um, uh, and how much um, that too will hold back the labor market um, and uh, families who are having to juggle um, those uh, caregiving burdens um, with employment. That's yes, right. Another issue that's gotten relatively little attention that I've seen, but I think is also very important, has been the effect of the declines in public transportation for low for low wage workers. You know, they now have to wait instead of waiting a half hour for a bus, they may have to wait an hour for a bus. And and I think that also is discouraging work for for, for some of these folks. Yes, the question of transportation, particularly public transportation in bigger cities, um, I think is going to be one of the hardest to resolve. Um, uh, issues coming out of this pandemic. Um, it was already a big city recession. Um, uh, and that's you know, another way in which uh, this pandemic has been different uh, from other uh, recessions of recent decades. Um, this has been a big city recession. Um, the types of industries uh, that tend to cluster in bigger cities have been most affected, uh, like arts and entertainment uh, and tourism. Um, but also uh, in a lot of bigger cities, uh, you've got concentrations of industries like tech and finance where more people can work from home. And people working from home um, aren't spending as much uh, on restaurants and local retail and local services. Uh, and so in these places where more people can work from home, uh, like DC, uh, San Francisco, New York, Seattle, um, in those places, local businesses like restaurants uh, and local services are suffering even more than elsewhere. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, the challenges that bigger cities face uh, are uh, significant uh, and, again, unusual, especially compared to previous recessions. So this, this kind of goes back to this argument about will things never be the same or will we kind of go back to pre-pandemic life? And I think one of the interesting questions is what happens to those office workers? Are, will, once the vaccine is widely dispersed, once, once the fear of the, the, the pandemic itself begins to ease, will people go back to work or will it back to work in an office? Or will people in fact say, you know what, this working from home, pretty good, I'm gonna keep doing it. Yeah, I think it'll vary hugely um, by sector, 
um, by team within organizations, and even um, by person, um, and certainly by sector, in that there are some uh, kinds of jobs uh, that are much uh, easier to do from home uh, than others. Um, I think we may start to see um, some uh, FOMO, uh, fear of missing out, uh, among people who start to see their colleagues or competitors go back to the office um, and realize that you know if uh, the people that they might be competing with for promotions or to make sales um, are showing up in person, um, they need to as well. Um, I think it also uh, uh, working from home um, may be a much bigger challenge for younger workers um, who don't know their organizations as well. They haven't been there as long. Um, they haven't developed the same kinds of professional networks um, that older workers have. Uh, and so uh, we're likely to see um, lots of differences um, in the eagerness uh, to go back to the office. Um, I mean, I think in terms of like the effects on the labor market and on housing markets, um, the details of how remote work uh, plays out um, are incredibly important. Um, it's very, very different. Um, someone who uh, ends up working 90% of the time from home, um, but still goes in once every other week um, and needs to be within a long commuting distance of the office versus someone who is working remotely 99% of the time and really only needs to show up maybe once a quarter uh, for an offsite uh, or a planning meeting um, and really feel like they can live almost anywhere. Um, you know, 90 versus 99% remote um, might not feel that different in terms of organizational processes um, and sort of daily cadence, um, but has very different implications uh, for where people might live and the kinds of commuting trade-offs uh, they need to make. Uh, so I think you know, that's uh, because um, the effect on labor markets and housing markets um, will hinge on some of these you know, fairly fine gradations uh, in how remote work plays out. Um, it ends up making it very difficult uh, to start predicting what might happen uh, to uh, residential or commercial real estate markets. So even though you just said it's going to be difficult, I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Um, so uh, let's, talk, let's talk about housing first. Um, are we going to see a resurgence of the suburbs? Is, you know, there was a big trend, a trend in, in, in some big cities, including DC and San Francisco, you know, move to, move to city, get a, you know, get a condo, get an apartment. Uh, anecdotally, there's been a lot of talk that people are now more interested again in suburbs. They want a little more green so they can walk in the, in the pandemic. Uh, and more broadly, is this going to be a, a, a you know, the trend you were just describing? Does this mean more of us are going to move to places like Idaho and West Virginia if, if we don't re really need to go to work? Yeah, well, first of all, um, uh, the suburbanization in America um, really never reversed. Um, it slowed somewhat um, during uh, the recovery of the early 2010s. Um, but you know, for the most part, the urban revival um, was uh, fairly limited to some demographic groups and some neighborhoods uh, in certain cities. So uh, I think we're going to uh, see a return to a more regular pace of suburbanization um, certainly, if people are working 90% um, remotely, um, that gives people a chance um, to uh, uh, move further out uh, from a traditional downtown. If that means um, more space, uh, lower housing costs, uh, perhaps different schools, uh, in exchange for a longer commute that they have to do less frequently. Um, I think the 99% remote um, will be relatively rare um, mm. and in the sense uh, of leading people to um, really move anywhere. I mean, to move sort of out of a big labor market, um, your job needs to be remote. Um, the jobs of anyone else in your household that works needs to be remote. Um, and um, you need to expect that your future job searches um, are going to be for jobs that also um, have a pretty good chance of being remote. I mean, people live not only where their current job is, um, but um, in the labor market um, where they might want to be um, when they're searching for their next job. Uh, so uh, I think we could see uh, some movement um, uh, uh, from a city to suburb, um, particularly among people who were living 
uh, in urban neighborhoods uh, to reduce their commute. Um, I think we'll probably see less movement um, to uh, more remote areas uh, that are uh, less connected to vibrant labor markets. Um, uh, but I think uh, even if we see uh, effects uh, in terms of housing prices and rents, um, people are mobile um, and uh, declining uh, housing prices or rents and increased affordability uh, in some expensive neighborhoods um, will attract other people um, who had been priced out by the people who had to be there uh, to reduce their commute um, and might attract people who want to be in dense areas uh, for other reasons. Um, and so um, we're likely to see uh, that the, the change that we see um, in cities um, is more likely to be a compositional shift uh, of who is living there and why, um, rather than you know, some sort of massive depopulation uh, of urban areas. So, so even though downtown Washington and downtown San Francisco look a little like ghost towns today, you, you think that they'll, they'll, they will be back even if some of the people living in them are different than the people who were living in them before. Yes, I, I, think, I think downtowns will be back, um, as you say, um, perhaps with some different people, uh, perhaps uh, with uh, some different businesses, um, but they're not going away. So that raises another question I think is very interesting. So we, we have lost a lot of, for example, restaurants. We talked about the decline of services in the pandemic. What will happen in the spaces that were occupied by restaurants once the pandemic is over? Will they be reoccupied by new restaurants? And will the servers from the old restaurants just get jobs in the new ones? Or will those spaces be repurposed in some way? So I think this gets to a sort of broader question of what kind of longer term scarring or damage um, there is from the pandemic. Um, I think you know, for people who uh, you know, own uh, a restaurant uh, or a small business um, and have lost that business, had to go bankrupt, had to shut down, um, they will feel long lasting effects. Um, but um, it's likely that, I mean, you know, spaces that were restaurants, you know, will probably be restaurants again. Um, uh, the constraints on opening a restaurant um, aren't as great as some of the uh, supply constraints uh, in other kinds of sectors um, that may take longer to rebuild. Um, we've already seen um, that uh, restaurants, uh, restaurant hiring um, has uh, adjusted you know, on a month to month or even week to week basis um, with uh, shutdowns and reopenings um, much more quickly than we've seen in some other sectors like hospitality and tourism, um, which uh, may take longer to ramp up. There may be more uh, long-term damage, uh, particularly um, if there are uh, now supply constraints, um, infrastructure uh, that has deteriorated, um, pilots whose licenses need to be recertified, um, planes that need to uh, come back into service. Um, you know, so you know, it's worth thinking about sectors that can ramp up quickly um, versus those uh, where um, the uh, rebound in demand for those services um, might outpace um, the rebound in supply because of constraints, uh, at least uh, for some initial period. Mm -hmm. we, we're talking about workers, we've been talking about, about uh, 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 firms. I wanna ask you about neighborhoods. Um, particularly think about low income neighborhoods that have suffered the loss of jobs, local businesses, they've had high level of illness and death from COVID. How long is it gonna take them to recover? So um, I think uh, there's the question of the, the people in lower income neighborhoods and the businesses in lower income neighborhoods. Um, and the story may be a little bit different. Um, certainly when we talk about people or households um, the uh, losses in terms of job loss, income loss, um, health effects, case rates and death rates um, have been uh, by far uh, worst for lower income people, uh, lower income households. Um, but the biggest declines in spending um, have sometimes been um, for businesses in higher income neighborhoods. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we think about um, the places that look most different today in terms of uh, closed businesses, um, they are uh, often in central business districts. Um, and uh, of course, 
you know, a lot of the businesses in expensive neighborhoods uh, are where people who live in lower income neighborhoods work. Um, and so uh, you know, the uh, effect uh, of what is happening in spending patterns uh, in higher income neighborhoods um, has a direct effect on the welfare of people um, who work in those establishments uh, and maybe more likely to live in lower income neighborhoods. Uh, and so um, the uh, visuals of where stores have closed um, might make it look like higher income neighborhoods have been more affected. Um, but uh, since we care about what is happening to the welfare of the people and households who live in neighborhoods, um, you know, the effects uh, will clearly be worse uh, in lower income neighborhoods. We've just got about five minutes left and I wanted to ask you a, a couple of policy questions. Um, given all we've just been discussing for the last 25 minutes, what do you think the most appropriate policy response is going forward? Congress just passed another bill after six months of delay, but there'll be another one after that sometime in January, February. What should be in it? What should the policy response be? Um, well, first of all, of course, I was very glad to see um, more relief, particularly for the unemployed. Um, uh, the uh, sort of missing features or what I, what I would like to see more of would certainly be um, more aid uh, to state and local governments, uh, in particular focus on um, public transit, uh, since uh, I think that's one area where uh, long-term scarring uh, is quite plausible. Um, I think the other area is education, um, where you know, the, the damage uh, to kids who have been um, in distance learning um, and uh, uh, succeeding or struggling with that uh, to different degrees um, you know, is uh, an urgent uh, policy priority. Um, and I'm, I am certainly not an education finance expert uh, to be able to draw that to, okay, these are the areas of spending that are necessary. Um, but you know, in terms of what I worry about most um, that deserves policy attention, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, of course, um, uh, vaccination, um, but then uh, focusing on what's going to happen, um, uh, particularly to transit um, and to education. $2,000 checks? Um, uh, I am ready for checks. Um, uh, would like to see, you know, the, you know, that come out of the cost uh, of other kinds of aid um, that are essential. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you had to spend a few hundred billion dollars and you had a choice between state and local aid or more payments to individuals, which way would you go? So that, you know, that's a question that gets to the point of depending too much on the details. Um, fortunately, I trust um, you and your colleagues um, <laughs> to get us the right answer on that. <laughs> good, good luck with that. And, and finally, a question, do you have any other suggestions for the incoming Biden administration? If you were asked by them, what, what, what would you tell them? So I focus on the labor market um, and what it means for the economy. Um, I think um, one policy issue that you know, has you know, certainly been at the center of the past many years um, has been immigration. Um, uh, not always, um, uh, talked about with the angle for what it means for the labor market and the economy. Um, but I think the sort of most critical uh, long-term issue uh, for the economy uh, is what our immigration policy looks like um, and whether um, we uh, remain a destination uh, for people looking to come here for school, uh, to start businesses. Uh, I mean, increasingly, um, the uh, sort of range of industries um, who depend on immigrants um, has widened um, and you know both uh, both in terms of uh, sort of growth in a macro sense um, but also growth in some of the industries that are most important to our economy um, I think hinges a lot on our longer term immigration policy great well Jay Coco thank you so much we're out of time we could do this for another half an hour I hope maybe we'll get a chance to do it again Thanks so much and uh, be healthy and be safe in the coming year. You too. Thanks very much. Thank you.